Hey everybody, check out my cool new fashion accessory. Hi, I'm Michael, and this is my review of four albums from 1992. Please excuse the sort of relaxed look of this video. I may have broken my toe, so I need to be sitting with my leg up for a while, but uh, I still wanted to make this video for you because I care. So the four albums that I wanted to cover today are Smog's Forgotten Foundation, Nine Inch Nails' Broken EP, 10,000 Maniacs, Our Time in Eden, and PJ Harvey's Dry. I want to start this review off by saying that the score I give an album isn't really all that important. The scores of more experienced reviewers don't matter either. I personally try to keep other things that I reviewed in mind so that each score is in the right place relative to other things I've reviewed, but ultimately this is just my opinion from a certain day. My opinion might change tomorrow, and so might yours. It is with that the scores don't matter approach in mind that I want to tackle a few less than huge projects from 1992. Even though I don't think these are all great, I think they are the products of really excellent artists. The first such album is Forgotten Foundation by Smog. Smog was the former name that still active musician Bill Callahan recorded under. Especially early in Smog's discography, Bill's music was known for being incredibly lo-fi. This lo-fi sound was not necessarily just an artistic choice. Bill also had less access to good recording equipment and less access to other professionals to work with. Forgotten Foundation was Smog's second album, and it's pretty rough around the edges, sometimes in a good way, sometimes not. This was the last album Bill recorded at home before he was signed to a label. I don't want to spend a lot of time going into detail about each track on this album. It's a 22-track album, but also the specifics wouldn't feel as useful in discussing this whole project. In broader strokes, the tracks on this album range from borderline unlistenable to actually pretty great, like the tracks Your Dress, This Insane Cop, and I'm Smiling. Those three have the strongest melodies of the album and the most forward momentum. There are times on the album where a lack of forward momentum is used for an interesting effect though, too. But the overall feeling I get from much of this album is abrasive, dense, and impenetrable. And those are not necessarily bad things. I'm ultimately glad that Bill had all of this time to experiment on his own and to develop his own ideas. Looking at what few reviews I could find for this album around the time of its release, the aggregate I put together gives it an average of 50%. Not exactly strong reviews, but my own score for this album comes out to a 59%. I'm looking forward to getting to Smog's and Bill's future albums. There's some great stuff in there. Moving from an artist who has great music in his future to one that has great music in both his past and his future, now let's look at Nine Inch Nails' EP, Broken. After the release of Nine Inch Nails' first album, Pretty Hate Machine, which is one of my all-time favorites, Trent Reznor was dissatisfied with his label TVT. Trent wanted Nine Inch Nails to move into a heavier, more industrial sound, while TVT wanted Nine Inch Nails to stay on the synth-pop side of industrial. Trent and his producer for this album, Flood, were meeting in secret to try and put something together without TVT knowing. But then TVT just traded Nine Inch Nails to Interscope Records without Trent's knowledge. So the sound of the broken EP, the first release on Interscope, was understandably angry. But this was already a sound direction that Trent wanted to go in. This 8-track EP was originally released with 6 tracks on the main compact disc, and the last 2 tracks on a separate mini-CD. When that proved too expensive to produce, later releases had those last two songs as tracks 98 and 99 on the album, preceded by tracks 7 through 97, which were just one second of silence apiece. The cassette release of the EP put those first six songs on side A, and the last two tracks at the very end of side B, after about 15 minutes of silence. So, how do I feel about this album? Kind of mixed, honestly. I really love the songs Wish and Last. 
Wish has incredible drums right from the start. I'd say, though, that the song isn't quite as good as any of my favorites on Pretty Hate Machine, but I acknowledge that that's just my taste and is probably not the taste of the average Nine Inch Nails listener. Wish won Nine Inch Nails a Grammy for Best Metal Performance. Referencing a line from the song, Trent joked that his epitaph should read, Died. Said fist fuck. Won a Grammy. The last two tracks of the EP are covers, or partial covers, it's a little murky. Physical is a song by Adam and the Ants, and it's a good song. Suck is credited to Trent and Pigface. Trent was a member of Pigface briefly. Pigface claimed that he had nothing to do with the song, but Trent seems to claim that he did most of the work on the song himself. I don't know what the truth is, but I do know that the song has a kick-ass bass line, and I love the layering that happens right at the beginning of the song. Much of the rest of the EP is unfortunately forgettable, in my opinion. It all seems lackluster, uncomfortable to me in a bad way, or just an intro or transition. The critics of the time gave this what I calculated to be a 75% average. I give the EP a 78%. Our Time in Eden is 10,000 Maniacs' fifth album. We've mentioned other albums of theirs on this channel before, but this is the first review that we've done here. Molly and I both grew up with their MTV Unplugged album as an important part of our childhoods. For the most part, that was the only of this band's albums that I knew. I figured I should probably listen to a full album, so I picked this one, and I ended up really enjoying it. Our Time in Eden is the last 10,000 Maniacs album with Natalie Merchant in the band. Natalie's replacement as lead vocalist, Mary Ramsey, plays violin and viola on a few tracks on this album. Mary's strings and the playing of other musicians beyond a standard guitar, bass, keyboard, and drums are excellent in this album. I can't not get excited when I hear the brass in Few and Far Between and Candy Everybody Wants. Candy Everybody Wants is one of seven songs on this album that the band also performed on their MTV Unplugged concert. In general, I prefer the live recordings, but I don't know how much of that is due to my greater familiarity with them. The studio version of These Are Days is about on par with the live version, but I actually think the studio version of Candy Everybody Wants is better. The brass is so much more fun than the ooze in the vocals. One thing I really like about this album is its cohesion both in terms of sound and vocals. The sound is easy enough. Avoid having sounds that only appear on one song. Bring them back, or at least something similar to them, and on at least one more song. But this album is remarkably cohesive in its lyrics, too. Natalie Merchant is not only one of the most distinct vocalists in popular music, she's also one of its strongest lyricists. The style of the lyrics on the album veer from fairly straightforward storytelling to deep, winding, twisty poetry. But there are no missteps. Much of the album seems to be tied to a theme suggested by the album title, our time in Eden. From my reading of the lyrics, it seems like Natalie and the band are saying that our own experiences with each other create Eden, but our actions against each other have the consequence of banishing us from Eden. I think my biggest criticism of the album is in its sequencing, mainly in its first and last songs. It might be largely because of its placement in MTV Unplugged, but Noah's Dove sounds like such a last song for an album. On the studio album, it's first. The last track on the studio album is I'm Not The Man. This feels too intense and devastating to me to be last. I'd really like a song or two after it to help ease me back into the real world. Critics of the time gave the album what I calculate to be an average of 79%. I gave this album an 82%. Polly Jean Harvey is an English musician and front person for the band PJ Harvey, and she is, at times, PJ Harvey all by herself. PJ Harvey's first two albums were as a trio, but Polly Jean continued the name as a soloist after that. Dry is PJ Harvey's debut album. It was Kurt Cobain's 16th favorite album ever, according to his journals. Rolling Stone named PJ the Songwriter of the Year in 92, and also the Best New Female Singer in 92. PJ would go on to be, at least as of this recording, the only artist to have received the Mercury Prize twice. And I love Dry. This album has a raw feel to it. 
It's visceral. It's immediate. It's in your face. The bass and guitars roar. The choruses explode out from the verses. PJ presents characters in these songs and describes their situations, but doesn't tell us how we should feel about them. She leaves that to us. I like how playful the music is, too. Groups of three notes compete with groups of four in dress. Metric recontextualizations show up in Happy and Bleeding, especially when the fragments of melodies overlap and build on top of each other. Hair is in five, but that's partially disguised by the drum's intricate pattern. Fountain changes time signatures from seven to four and back again. Water is in five. This is a remarkably tight trio. Steve Vaughn matches PJ's ferocity on his bass, and his growling bass slides are some of the coolest sounds on the album. Rob Ellis is a beast on drums, and his songs with co-writing credit, Joe and Plants and Rags, are great. I also love whenever his vocals appear on a track. PJ herself is a commanding vocalist and guitarist, but also plays violin on a couple songs. I can't sing this album's praises enough. You should make sure you check it out if you like rock music and you don't know it. Critics of the time gave it what I calculated as an average of 87%. My score for this album is 86%. I want to reiterate one final time. The numbers don't really matter. What I think is more accurate is the order that these albums appear, but some of that is skewed too because of the scores from Ramin and Molly that are in this mix. These aren't only my opinions, but the scores from the four albums I talked about in this video are just mine. What do you think of these albums? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to read your opinions and chat with you about them. Please give this video a like if you liked it. Please give it a pity like if you didn't like it. To this side is a video that YouTube thinks you'll like, so check that out. Up there is the link to our channel. We review and discuss media, especially music and video games. Subscribe to us to see more if you dig that sort of thing. And maintain your groovy selves.